Welcome into another episode of Locked On Phillies. And the Phils won on a walk-off last night, courtesy of Christian Pache in extra innings. And the offense was still very quiet. We'll break down last night's game and look forward to tonight's as Ranger Suarez is on the mound. Also, I've got some comforting numbers for you uh, about the Philadelphia Phillies. One on their record and a handful on the starting pitching, which has been stupendous. Aaron Nola was great last night. And we got to talk about it. The Nick Castellano swing scene around the world. All of that on today's episode. You are Locked On Phillies, your daily Philadelphia Phillies podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, this is Locked On Phillies. You might be like, what's going on? New intro? Yes. New haircut? Yes. I'm Connor Thomas, your host, by the way. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Please make sure you're rating, reviewing, subscribing to the YouTube, all that great stuff. And today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it. I've got a competitive side. You know this. Come on. If you know me, you know I'm competitive. And it's a big thing, Monopoly Go, for my competitive side. You got to check it out. The mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. Join your friends and download Monopoly Go, now free on the App Store or Google Play. Uh, so, yeah, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, I've had this before, but I went back to the uh, the mullet look, and last year I saved the season with the victory shirt, the Hawaiian Phillies shirt. This year, people are saying Phillies 1-0 in the Connor Mullet era, but no, I had nothing to do with it. It was all Christian Pache late last night. Well, it was all Aaron Nola to keep the Phillies in the game, but Pache is the hero. He has a walk-off in the bottom of the 10th inning for the Philadelphia Phillies. Two outs, Bryson Stott on third. Now he was the ghost runner on second. To start the inning, and Christian Pache comes through in a big spot. Pache had just been inserted a couple innings before as a pinch runner for Kyle Schwarber in the DH spot. You thought, okay, well, Schwarber's probably not going to come up again, so we'll put Pache in. And then, of course, Pache ends up in the biggest spot in the game, and the guy delivers. I'll tell you what. I I think Pache is a solid Major League Baseball player. I do. And I think the only reason he's not playing more for the Philadelphia Phillies is because Johan Rojas is so darn good defensively, and Pache's good defensively too, but they want to see Rojas develop more. And Pache's been with multiple teams. There's kind of already an idea of what his ceiling could be. I am a Christian Pache guy, but I'm also not ready to say, oh, Pache has a walk-off. He should be the center fielder or the right fielder for that matter because I've seen that. We're going to talk about Nick Castellanos later. But a great moment for Pache, who hasn't played much. And that just shows you that these guys coming off the bench for the Phillies are ready to play. Whit Merrifield hasn't had the best start to the year. He's 28 at bats in. He's going to get to a point where he looks more like the all-star from last year than he was. Edmundo Sosa has had his moments. Christian Pache has had his moments. I mean, Garrett Stubbs has done well catching Spencer Turnbull. The bench for the Phillies has a different feel this year, and that's a good thing. The problem is the Phillies scored two runs total last night, and it took them 10 innings to get to that second run. And they're facing Cal Quantrill, who is not that good of a starter. He's no Cy Young, all right? We'll say that. I'm surprised that the Phillies' offense didn't get rolling more last night, and that's definitely concerning. We talked about the offensive issues. Am I overly worried about it from a season perspective? No. Am I kind of worried about it right now, like as we look at, how the team's currently playing, you kind of have to be. It's unfair not to be because they're just not producing often enough offensively. But when Aaron Nola pitches the way that he did last night, seven and a third innings pitch, nine strikeouts, only allowing a run on a home run, like he was dominant and he should be against this Rockies lineup. But at the same time, like you got to tip your cap to him. And we're going to have some numbers on the starting rotation coming up a little bit later on the podcast. You're going to want to hear if you were in the camp of the rotation isn't good enough, they needed to add more pitchers this offseason. Wait till we get to those numbers. But let's talk a little bit more about last night's game because the numbers from the players that you'd expect to be the major contributors, the Bryce Harpers, the JT Ramudos, the Kyle Schwarbers, Trey Turners, like you didn't really see much from them at all last night against a very, very hittable pitcher in Cal Quantrill. Just listen to some of these numbers. Kyle Schwarber, 0 for 3, did have a walk, but a strikeout as well. Trey Turner, 1 for 4. He had a run scored. Add a strikeout on there. Bryce Harper, 
one for three. I mean, it's good to see Trey and Bryce have hits. JT Ramuto, one for four. Like, but you'd expect these guys to start having some of those breakout games you'd expect from big time players. Nick Castellanos, over four. Brandon Marsh, over four. Now, Marsh just had an outstanding start to the year, so I'm not going to fault him for one off night. Bryson Stott was really the guy that created the most for the Phillies offense. He was two for three. He had the run scored on the ghost runner deal. He also added a walk on there, so he's on base three out of his four plate appearances. Uh, that's pretty darn good. Merrifield over three, Rojas over three. It's just they're not stringing hits together. They're not. And it's the same thing I was talking about in yesterday's episode. You can go back and listen to it deeper explanation of it, but they've got guys getting hot individually for games, but they don't have guys getting hot for series. They don't have guys getting hot at the same time. It seems like they're almost passing the baton saying it's your turn to hit rather than, Hey, we can all hit well in one game. They haven't had that ex explosive like breakout game. You thought it was going to come potentially last night. Still two more games against the Rockies with not great pitching uh, on the docket on Colorado's side, so maybe it will still come. Here's the thing. They won last night. They won a tight game. Winning tight games like that is evident of the spots the Phillies have been in the past couple years. Big-time playoff experience, World Series experience, down the stretch games, meaning things. You learn how to find ways to win. And the Phillies clearly are a team that know how to win tight games. They just know how to do the right thing in the right spots to get to a place where you don't have to worry as much when they're going to extras or they're tight in a game late. So that's a good sign. I can't bring myself to a place where I'm like overly critical of the offense after a win. I mean, they did enough to win the game. I already told you they need to be better. But if you win, I don't care if they score one run every game the rest of the year. If they continue to win baseball games, they're doing what they need to. So that's good enough for me. I understand it's not good enough for everybody, and I want to see the offense do better. But it was a win last night. The Phillies are now 9-8 and eight on the season. Let's look forward to tonight's game as well because it's game two tonight of their series with the Rockies. 6.40 p.m. first pitch, just like last night at Citizens Bank Park. Ranger Suarez is on the mound. He's 2-0 and on the year with a 2.65 ERA. He's had an outstanding start to the year. Austin Gobber is on the mound for the Colorado Rockies. He's got 4.91 ERA, better than what Cal Quantrill brought in with an over seven ERA yesterday. But another guy that's a very gettable pitcher. Now he's a lefty, so we'll see. Will Brandon Marsh and Bryson Stock get days off? Marsh went over four yesterday. Or are they going to give him a day? And maybe Pache, your walk-off winner, will play left field. Who who knows? It could be interesting, but. Uh, we'll see when the lineup comes out. It's not out of time of me recording this. I look at this game tonight, and I see 70% chance for the ESPN analytics that the Phillies have to win. That's really high. Normally, it's like if you're favored, 56 to 60%. 70%, they're highly favored of this. They're minus 250 on the money line. So do I expect another win from the Phillies tonight? Absolutely. And with Ranger Swirls on the mound, do I expect another strong pitching performance? 100%. You're looking at a situation where this is a Colorado Rockies team that is not on the same level as the Phillies. I said it before the series started, and yeah, it's held up through one game, but it wasn't exactly a dominant performance by the Phillies. So I would love to see them actually hang it on the Rockies in tonight's contest. One other thing before we move on from last night's game and just the overview of the games altogether. The Jeff Hoffman play at the plate. If you didn't see it, there was a play with the go-ahead run on third base. The Rockies, for some reason, pinch ran a pitcher and then got the pitcher hurt because he slid into home and Jeff Hoffman was coming home to try and make a play. And JT Romito flipped the ball to him after the ball kind of popped up in the air at home plate. And then Hoffman slid in front and blocked the bag. I will say it. If you're a Rockies fan watching this, Jeff Hoffman blocked the bag. But in the umpire's defense, I'd be mad about this if it happened to the Phillies. So I'm just going to be fair. Like, I don't think it was technically the right call. But it was bang, bang, and it was also the pitcher. If it is a third baseman blocking the third base back, if it is a catcher blocking home plate, like – someone who you expect to be there, it's a lot more natural for the umpires to call that blocking the play. 
for a pitcher coming home on a timing play with a guy sliding in and Jeff Hoffman sliding in himself and the guys colliding, it's, it's really hard to institute a call of blocking the plate on that. Is it technically by letter of the law blocking the plate? Yes. Is it in the spirit of the rule? I don't believe so. Maybe I'm biased because I'm a Phillies fan, but I don't feel that should have been called blocking the plate, but I understand why Rockies fans are mad that it wasn't called. Whatever the case may be, it was now. The Phillies go on to win the game, and we'll take it. You'll take all you can get right now if you're the Philadelphia Phillies. But there's a couple interesting numbers that I want to give you coming up for anyone who's overly worried about where the Phillies are at right now. I think this is really good perspective, what I'm about to tell you in a second, for where the Phillies are at comparatively to other teams in the National League and to past Phillies teams that have had success. So we'll get into that as we continue today's episode of Locked on Phillies. But let's talk about our title sponsor, Monopoly Go. Come on, you absolutely love Monopoly, but this is not just Monopoly. Right, It is, but there's so much more with Monopoly Go. I already told you, I got my competitive side. And the way you can let that out, if you have one just like me, by downloading Monopoly Go, you had to have heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. That's half of Trey Turner's contract in dollar amounts. Like that's, that's insane. Not that it costs money. You can download it for free. But that's a lot of downloads. And it's a great twist on Monopoly where you play on not one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations. You build up amazing cities that bring you big money. You can play against or with your friends. You can rent properties, like all of the iconic Monopoly stuff with cool different things on the app. It's perfect. You can play it with buddies. You can play it solo. You can enjoy everything there is to offer in the normal, normal Monopoly game with twists from the app that make it so interesting. You're not going to want to put this app down. So go ahead and check it out. Get in the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go now, free, on the App Store or Google Play. I also want to tell you about Game Time. Game Time's awesome. You guys know Game Time. Everybody's talking about it. And why are they talking about Game Time? Because if you're trying to get tickets to an event, whether it's sports, theater, music, any of that stuff, you need to use game time. They're, they're just hands down the best. Like when you think about it, there used to be other competitors that people would use. No, like game time is the leader in the space. And here's why. They're an authorized ticket marketplace in Major League Baseball now. Shows you that the leagues believe in them. It makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the game time app actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch, tip off, puck drop, all of that stuff. They got killer last minute deals, all in prices. You can see the views from your seat before you buy and their lowest price guarantee. The game time guarantee means if you find tickets in your row and section for less than what you're paying on game time, they'll credit you 110% of the difference. Not just 100%, 110%. They go above and beyond at game time. They're amazing. So what you got to do, take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. You never want to worry if you're getting the best deal, you know, with the folks over at game time, download the game time app, create an account and use code locked on MLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again, create an account and redeem code locked on MLB for $20 off. That's it. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So there's some interesting numbers here in a couple of tweets that I saw. So I got to give credit to the guys who put these tweets out and uh, alerted me and the public to what the Philadelphia Phillies are exactly doing right now when it comes to comparison to their peers and comparison to teams of the past. So we're going to start with a tweet from Matt Gelb that I really find interesting because he put this out. Matt Gelb, who writes for The Athletic, uh, covers the team. He compared this Philly start to Philly starts of the past five years. And this was in response to the end of the game. The Phillies win 9-8. to eight. He says it's their best 17-game start. Now, 17 might seem like an arbitrary number, but still. The best 17-game start in five years, their 9-8 and eight record. 
So that means last year's team that was one game away from winning the National League was not as good through 17 games. Two years ago, team, which won the National League, went to the World Series, two games away from winning the World Series, was not this good through 17 games. And the three other teams before that that were relatively close to the playoffs, not this good through 17 games. That's just straight up a sign that this Phillies team, while the way they might be winning isn't exactly exciting yet, and it's not confidence-inspiring, they're winning more than past iterations of this team. They are playing better by the only metric that matters, how many games you win, than the past five years, or I guess the past four years worth of teams, because I imagine five years are counting uh, this current year. But that's a good sign. So if you're like, oh, this team stinks, it's the same old problems, well, they're getting better. And there's still time to even improve on that. There's a lot of time in April. You have two more against the Rockies, an easy series against the White Sox. I talked about expectations for this week in yesterday's episode. You can go ahead and check it out. It's the most recent episode here on the Locked On Phillies feed. But this is even better. That's just the Phillies compared to previous Phillies teams. And you might make an argument and say, well, none of those teams won the World Series. And technically, you'd be right, even though I think you're missing the point. But here's something from Bob Wankel of Crossing Broad. Uh, Bob covers the theme for Crossing Broad. See him in the press box all the time. Great guy. Same with Matt Cal. I don't want to say that like Matt's not a good guy. But he put out a tweet, Bob did, about the rankings statistically of the Philadelphia Phillies starting rotation. Listen to this. Here's how the Phillies rotation stacks up against National League teams. The Phillies rotational ERA, 295, first in the National League. Their 1.08 whip, first in the National League. 3.41 strikeout to walk ratio, first in the National League. 205 opponent batting average, first in the National League. 9.41 Ks per nine innings, second in the National League. 3.52 FIP, fielding independent pitching. Second in the National League, 2.0 war even, first in the National League. They're leading the National League in ERA, whip, uh, strikeout to walk percentage, opponent batting average, and war. This rotation is unbelievable. So to everybody out there who said, get Montgomery, get Snell, get this guy, get that guy, why didn't they find a way to get Yamamoto? Like, take a deep breath. We talked about it all offseason. This rotation is really good. Really, really good. The best in the National League right now. And they're carrying this team. Now, would this Phillies team be in a bad spot based on the lack of offensive production if the pitching staff wasn't this dominant? Yeah. And you say, okay, the starters have been that good, and the bullpen hasn't been bad, and you're only 9-8? and eight? Yeah, that's on the offense. The offense is the issue with this team right now. But the pitching staff is a bright spot in all of the National League and really in a lot of baseball. I mean, there's some good staffs in the American League, but the Phillies are up there with all of them. It's been an outstanding start to the year starting pitching-wise. So best 17-game start in the past five years, best rotation in the National League, and the offense, they're going to hit. They are. They're going to get to a spot where Bryce Harper, Trey Turner, Real Muto, Cassiano, Schwarber, like all of these guys and the younger guys, Boehm, Marsh, Stott, they're all going to heat up. They're going to get better. You've got multiple all-star, a lot of all-star level talent on this team, a couple of MVP potential talent levels on this team. I mean, Trey Turner's sitting over 300, so it's not like he's been quiet. Bryce Harper, we know what he is. It's just I don't know how many ways I could say it, but as annoying as some parts of the Philly season have been so far, this team is absolutely fine. But there was one thing from last night's game. I didn't mention it. Well, I mentioned it, but I didn't dive into it when we talked about last night's game. And there's one guy that uh, this fan base loves to talk about, and they're right to do so after his performance last night, specifically one singular pitch. And that's Nick Castellanos. And if you haven't seen it, well, I'll tell you what happened because it was not a great visual from Nick last night. We'll discuss the swing scene around the world coming up as we wrap up Locked on Phillies. First, though, let me talk to you about LinkedIn. You might be struggling to close deals, but buyer to buyer, business to business selling is tougher than ever. And that's why I want to tell you about LinkedIn Sales Navigator. 
LinkedIn Sales Navigator is a sales intelligence platform that helps professionals effectively prospect and engage high value customers, drive higher revenue and increase sales performance. Sales Navigator, it helps you target the right buyers, surface key signals such as job changes or which accounts you should prioritize and shows you hidden allies so you can find those buyers that are most likely to convert into sales. Fueled by LinkedIn's 1 billion member platform, a billion, a billion, Sales Navigator gives you the most up-to-date first-party data, enabling you to unlock conversations with the people that matter. Right now, you can try LinkedIn Sales Navigator and get a 60-day free trial at linkedin.com slash locked on. That's linkedin.com slash locked on for a 60-day free trial. Let LinkedIn Sales Navigator help you sell like a superstar today. Just go to linkedin.com slash locked on and you can get started. I, I hate to do this to the guy because if I'm being honest, I see Nick Castellanos as this. I've brought this up. You know what? I don't know that I've mentioned it on the podcast before, but I've I've brought this up on air at 97.5 The Fanatic on the radio side multiple times. And I made this kind of connection end of last year. Nick Castellanos and Reese Hoskins are very similar players at the plate. They're both really streaky with really high upside. Here's the main difference. When Nick Castellanos is not hitting the baseball, he strikes out a bunch. When Reese Hoskins is not hitting the baseball, he walks a bunch. He just has a better approach at the plate. Does that make Reese Hoskins a better overall player? Certainly possible. That being said, Nick Castellanos is a two-time All-Star, which is more of a resume than Hoskins has. And this isn't to pit them against each other. But my point is, People used to have the same reaction to Reese Hoskins when he would go cold, and he'd still be walking, but people wanted to see him hit the ball out of the yard, show off that pop from the right side, and he would get cold at points, and people would lose their minds. Nick Castellanos gets cold in the same way. They're both just streaky hitters. But sometimes when I try and defend Nick Castellanos, right, and try to say, listen, I know it's bad right now, but when he gets hot, he's going to be one of the best hitters on planet Earth. I talked about this with Rojas earlier in the year uh, when he got picked off second base in the big spot. I forget who they were playing. But I was like, dude, you, you got to help me out. Help me help you. The old Jerry Maguire line, right? Uh, help me help you and don't do anything like crazy undefendable uh, for me to be able to talk about here. And Nick Castellanos last night was in a bat in the like mid to late innings. We know that the breaking ball, like the slider away, low and away normally, is the way to get Nick Castellanos out. Like everybody on planet Earth knows that. People that don't even watch baseball know that. I saw an old lady walking down the street today, and I asked her, excuse me, ma'am, do you know how to get Nick Castellanos out? And she goes, well, I'd throw him a nasty two-strike slider low and outside of the zone. He'd swing at it. I said, who are you, lady? But obviously that didn't happen. My point is, it's been known that that's the way to attack Nick Castellanos. But – at the major league level, I don't think the average fan appreciates how tough it is to lay off of a good slider slightly off the plate, low it away for a right-handed hitter. It, it's tough. It is a difficult pitch. Last night, though, Nick Castellanos, and credit to him, it looked like from the replay it was just a clean check swing. Didn't look like he offered, but he came very close to going around on a pitch that was a slider away that was almost out of the other batter's box. Not in the other batter's box. Almost out the other side of the other batter's box. If there was a left-handed batter in the box, the pitch probably would have gone behind them. And Nick Castellanos almost swung it. I'm just like, I saw it. And I was like, dude, please just cut me a break. I'm trying to defend you to this fan base. And that's pretty miserable. Now, some people react to it and thought, okay, this guy stinks. He's making up his mind too early to go after pitches. He's not even, like, considering where the ball's going to go. And from that one swing, it's pretty hard to defend. But I'm kind of at a point where the visuals are not there for Nick Castellanos. He doesn't look like a great hitter right now. But the track record is. And I've long been in baseball, a guy who believes in track record over everything. Once you've proven – multiple times over multiple seasons, you can be a plus hitter at the major league level. You're normally always at least an average hitter, if not like always a plus hitter. 
And Nick Cassianos has proven that in the past. I'm going to choose to believe in him. I'm going to try and take it easy on the guy. And I know that might make me soft or whatever, but I, I have no choice but to believe in him. What's the other option in the outfield? Whit Merrifield every day in right field. Christian Pache in right field over Nick Castellanos. I trust Castellanos more than those guys when he's at his best. So just got to hope Castellanos comes around and hope the rest of the team picks it up while we wait for that. But I couldn't not bring it up because that was uh, a brutal swing and a miss by, well, almost swing and a miss by Nick Castellanos. And you can just tell he's lost right now. I'm not asking for a standing ovation. Please do not do that. That's all played out by this point. But just got to cross your fingers and hope he figures it out. Either way, Phillies won. That's the most important thing. They get a chance to try and win their third series in out of four most recent series if they win tonight's game behind Ranger Suarez starting. So a great opportunity. Solid times for the Phillies right now. Everyone enjoy when they win. If they lose games like that, then we're going to have a different conversation. But like I told you, they got to win both of these series, and they're starting off well on that way. So we'll have another game to react to tomorrow and a lot of stuff to get into, I'm sure, from tonight's contest. We'll cover all that on the next episode of Locked On Phillies. But that's all for today's episode. Thank you so much for checking us out. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And please, again, make sure you're rating, reviewing, subscribing, all that great stuff. I'll talk to you tomorrow on our next episode.